To have a good harvest, one must plant good seeds and must also use the right kind of fertilizer. The carrots have grown large and firm. How good they will taste. Well, welcome back to the Backyard Gardens podcast, everybody. We hope you're having an absolutely amazing gardening season. It is coming to an end shortly, not right away. Everybody relax, but shortly. But uh, you ever seen those numbers on the seed packs that tell you the uh, day to harvest? Well, we got to talk about that today. And um, this comes from a question. So um, right off the bat, before we get started, Batavia, what is your opinion on that date? Um, it's never going to be exactly accurate unless you were in my backyard garden two seasons ago when I sowed radish, radishes and it told me 30 days from seed to harvest. And it was exactly that. That's the only time in my history. There you go. So that, that's it, everybody. I hope everybody has a fantastic day. And uh, we will. No, I'm joking. Yeah, it's, um, you know, we've got a, a list uh, to go by. And we'll get into all aspects of it, but it's important to kind of use it as a guide, I think, though. You know what I mean? I don't think we should you take it as gospel, but I think it should definitely be a guide. Yeah, I think that um, I'm checking our list again. I definitely err on the side of you may need more days, the likelihood of you needing less days like that. That all depends. It all depends on everything we're going to talk about today. Yeah. So this comes, um, this is actually a question of the day that we thought just, we really wanted to talk about it because this falls in line with zones for us. Mm -hmm. Um, We hate it. There you go. But there's some validity to it and there's some caveats to it too. But um, this comes from sarah who she emailed it to us at bygquestion at gmail.com so you can be just like sarah and send us a question and says hi ben and batavia hey sarah hi sarah i hope you email finds you well i've been listening since relocating from washington state to indiana a couple years ago i've done greenhouse gardening raised beds and now i have a patio garden and community garden plot and learn new things every year and love developing my skills. I have a question. Would you please help clarify how the plant cycle works in regards to timing when planting seeds and then when to harvest? I'm specifically confused about whether germination time is part of the overall number of days of harvest. I've been trying to plan approximate planting and harvest times to help with succession planting and maximizing my harvest, but the approximate dates make me confused and nervous. Perhaps could you explain how it works using a scenario? I sure appreciate all you do. Give a high five to Leonard for me too. There you go, Leonard. Cheers. So importantly, hey, garden neighbor. (laughs) <laughs> so also note if you are in one of the bordering states to Illinois if you are in Illinois you are a garden neighbor but also if you're in a bordering state I don't go two states over but anything that's touching the tip of Illinois you're in my camp yeah I have no garden neighbors so there you go <laughs> we're two different people everybody what can I say but uh yeah so there's there's a lot cooking here, um, and it's a, it's a good question because it does get confusing, and it's something that we need to consider when we are planning our gardens and planting our gardens uh, in the future. So, um, you know, I remember when I first started gardening, I would look at those numbers, and I would also look at the little maps on the back of some of the packets mm-hmm. about when to plant. Mm -hmm. And I would just, I would run with it and I would go and take it to my grave that that was the way it was supposed to work. And I've learned that again, it's a good guide. It's not necessary. And, um, your opinion, Batavia germination time included in days to harvest. No. Okay. My opinion is yes. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So in the history of Backyard Gardens podcast, I don't know if I've ever given a one word answer. I don't think you have. Wouldn't it be the time that it 
conflicts with your one word answer. <laughs> we should stick everything to one word answers and see how how short we can cut the show. <laughs> but um, there's there's a couple reasons why, and I think we'll get into it. But uh, what affects germination times? That's uh, that's an important thing to get right off the bat. Yeah, temperature as well as light and water. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you know, we kind of for say sh- like yeah, yeah, for but sure. how many No, I, so yeah. obviously so let's uh, take a step back. Soil medium. Mm. Water. Mhm. Temperature. Mm-hmm. So it almost you reverse the question, what's a requirement? What are the requirements for germination? Right. right. Yes, it's the answer will be the same, but the question is definitely different. So um, you're absolutely right. You know, yeah. a seed that has no moisture isn't just going to pop up, you know. Well, so it's important that we understand right off the bat that that seed has moisture, enough moisture built into it to get it the very first root to come out. But the moisture that we add is to soften the shell of that seed so that it can then grow, start to grow, basically pop out. Um, so you're, you're exactly right. Temperature, big deal. Um, you know, too hot, too cold. Uh, the moisture, the reason why I kind of, I don't know if I gasped, but I made some kind of noise or comment when you said that was, I mean, how many times have you started a seed and then like forgot to water it or something and kind of set it back a little bit. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then you go back and you give it water and then it's like, boom, it just starts to really grow. Mm -hmm. So um, that's definitely one. And soil medium, I kind of took for granted, but I think you're exactly right. Soil medium is a big deal. I mean, if you're using like a real, like um, I know at first I would use like just regular potting soil and that it rarely worked well for me. Um, When I switched to a more, a finer soil, it worked better because the roots can push through the ground. They have, they can hold moisture better and it's softer form. So you definitely get that as well. Mm-hmm. So it, all those things taken into account make a, a big difference. Now let's, since we're here, young Ben, why am I concerned about the soil medium when I'm starting seeds and seed sales or seed blocks? And I can scatter seeds outside in my yard where there's all kinds of soil mixed up in there and seeds are germinating. Like, what's the difference there? Well, so first of all, I don't like the fact that I'm taking a test right now, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I've thought about this before because the thought process in my head at one point was like, well, I'll just go throw seeds out there and let them grow. And that doesn't really work as good as you think. Um, you know, when, when I target a soil container, you know, some kind of cell or block or something like that, and I put three seeds in, generally I get three seeds that germinate. Mm -hmm. Um, if I go out there into the ground, there's a lot that can happen. You know, it can get too hot and dry out the soil. Um, it can be, you know, all the previous things we said, but the germination rate in my experience has not been as um, as good as if I've done something in a cell. I think it appears that way because usually you throw out a lot of seeds and you're just like, whatever. You, I mean, when you, if you were just to scatter seeds, would you be as precise as you are putting in seed cells or would you just kind of dump a pack of seeds out there? In, in this scenario, I'm just scattering them. I'm just dumping them. I'd never do that. But, um, but yeah, I think that, um, so I look at it and say, we're trying to come up with this kind of fine, perfect soil medium when we're starting seeds. And let's say seed trays. I know people use seed blocks and things and, and other um, containers to, to start seeds. But then I look and say, this raised bed that I have, it's like really dense soil uh-huh. and seeds are germinating, right? You know, uh-huh. and the reality is that the conditions in nature let's call nature the raised bed for a moment are made to help that seed along with the germination and growth where it's different when it comes to you're bringing it indoors you don't have ants moving things around you don't have you know you don't have that 
the level of oxygen that's coming through the soil and that living soil that's in your raised bed. It's a different scenario. I do believe you're right. It feels like I have like 20 volunteer lettuce plants that seeds just blew around, right? Yeah. You know, but didn't I have like a thousand seeds that had an exactly. opportunity to blow around and I only have 20, you know? So, um, so again, just a little bit of devil's advocate there. Yeah, but I mean, I think too, when we start them in seed cells, we're very precise in how much seed, how much soil goes on top, mm-hmm. how much water it gets. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, overall they're just nursed better. Um, but I, I, I think it's a valid question because it it seems, and I mean, I do a lot of direct sowing too, but I tend to direct sow more um, liberally mm-hmm. with my seeds. So I'll put three, four, five seeds in a hole when I direct sow them versus in a pot. Mm. And I think that's one of the things that um, we really got to think about too as we move forward in this is like, how are we as a gardener? Because it's, it, you know, it's one of those subjects where we can't just openly talk about like all gardeners do this because everybody does it. Every single person listening to this does it differently. And um, that's really important. But You know, I started a bunch of seeds in summertime this year in a drought, and I actually did fairly well with them, but I nursed the crap out of them. I watered them every day. I mulched them so that they could stay, you know, moist longer, and I finally did get germination. Um, It would be interesting if you did that and you did a side-by-side. I've never, I don't think I've ever done that, but um, not overly concerned about it, but it is something that I think is very interesting that um, it just seems to work better when I do it in cells, which is why I tend to do more of those in cells. Plus, you're kind of getting a jump start on the season. You know, we've said that a million times on this show. So that's always part of it. Um, but we, you said temperature. Temperature is a really, really big one. And that can even make a seed not germinate at all. Not just germinate slowly, but not germinate or make it germinate faster. So that's applying heat or avoiding heat for your seeds. Well, temperature also kind of ties into that soil and that water as well, right? Mm -hmm. So temperature is going to impact how that soil medium dries out too. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think generally, we talked about more recently we were looking at a seed germination chart. I think we were talking about carrots as an example yeah. um, and the temperature that the ideal temperature that it germinates in. And then when it's too hot for that particular seed to germinate. Right. Like spinach is famous for not germinating when it's hot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, you know, thinking about that, but then on the flip side, like in the winter time and you're starting seeds in your house, if your house is colder, you can really like pepper seeds are famous for taking a long time yeah. to germinate, um, which is where adding heat mats and stuff like that will make a difference. But a common thought is, well, I don't need to always add it. I need to always add a heat mat. And that's just not true. Some of these seeds are very capable and if not loving grow you know germinating when it's cooler. So, you know, it's kind of, and the way I look at that is like, when does that plant typically grow? If it typically grows in the summer, add heat. If it typically grows in the, in the fall and the spring, mm-hmm. don't add heat, you know, mm-hmm. up to an extent. I mean, you can't start it in like 33 degree soil and be like, oh, it never germinated. Of course <laughs> not. Because what's going to happen? Do you know? I know, you know, if I say it, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, of course. I don't know. The seed's going to rot. Yeah. If it stays too moist. See? <laughs> <laughs> But it's kind of one of those things that you have to, you know, we have to understand as we move forward into this is like the temperature has a big deal to do with it because it also affects the water and the soil, the retention in the soil. So mm-hmm. if it's too hot, it evaporates. If it's too cold, it stays longer. So you yeah, have to I keep all that in mind. Something that I don't know, we talk, I don't think we talk about often enough. There's this the idea of quantity as well. So if I was starting just six plants, that's all I'm going to grow is six plants. The things that I do would likely be a lot more simplistic mm-hmm. when it comes to starting them versus 60. Yeah. Versus 600 across a season. 
right? You know, so there is a level of hedging your bets, a level of like, you know, protecting yourself from the gardener that you are. Um, so you look at, there's a, a timeline that we're working on, right? That's me snapping my fingers, like as into the motion says, we should be moving faster. There's a timeline we're working on. And the reason why Sarah's asking this is because this time matters. And this is the reason why it links to both fall and spring, I believe probably most importantly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely relevant for summer, of course. But when we're on a timeline that we need to be more precise with, I think in our fall and our spring plantings, this time that we're talking about to germinate a seed and steps that we can take to actually um, improve it, I think all of that's really, really relevant. And if you think about kind of the timing of this, a lot of us are doing things for fall plantings now, and we're doing things in various ways, seeding, indoors, direct sowing, you know, all of that ties into the timing of this, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's just, it's a piece to the puzzle to keep in mind as you start to go through this. And, it, you know, it's pretty fortunate across the board. Germination time tends to be seven to 10 days. Generally speaking, there's clearly some that are more and there's clearly some that could be less. But what I've noticed is if I apply more heat, sometimes, um, you know, and again, adding a heat mat on your seed shelf, um, direct sowing outside when it's warmer, you can get faster germination. Um, I had carrots last year that germinated in three days versus 20 days. Mm -hmm. And that was I mean, it was hot when I put them out there. But I think I was just able to cool that soil down enough that they just they popped early. I mean, it was, it was shocking. And I do it now. Like I just started a couple trays of seeds and I left them outside because they'll germinate faster. And then once they germinate, I'll bring them in and put them under my lights so I can kind of speed up that process mm -hmm. a little bit and not even worry about having the heat mats and stuff like that this time of year. So um, and that brings us to the days to harvest on the seed packet. And so, oh man, I, I really do hate those numbers. But uh, again, if you didn't have those numbers, where would you be when you go to plant something? You know what I mean? Yeah, well, so I'm looking at our notes here. I I know you think thinking that you know is she not paying attention i no, almost you're, always i are. hear you shaking seed packets constantly yeah. i know what you're doing <laughs> almost always absolutely in tune with my uh fellow buddy and pal and friend young ben but i brought these i have plastic bag of seeds and specifically for cabbage i was commenting with another gardener and um she said something like oh i plan on putting out a short season um, cabbage. And I said, Oh, thanks for the reminder. I've just generally said, I'm going to plant cabbage and I had my cabbage seeds, but I hadn't selected a particular variety. So I was going through the seeds that I have and marking down the days to harvest. Right. You know, and so cabbage is something that I already knew going in. Like there's some that actually come in the gate saying it's going to take a hundred days. Yeah. You know, um, it's going to take 120 days. Right. And I don't have that time <laughs> when it comes to where I am in the season now. And there's some that take a shorter period of time per the package or per, you know, what's known about this particular variety. I think I probably based on what I know about myself, err on the side of the longest and I'd either use my experience with growing that vegetable and this is how long it took and that'd be my gauge or I'd seek out someone else if there's no, back to your question, if there is no package information, how long did it take? And I probably would stumble along because, you know, I'd ask Sarah, you know, she's in Indiana, similar weather, right? You know, and yeah. she tells me it, it's to 90 days. I'd use that in my as my gauge until I found out otherwise within my own garden. Yeah. Confirmed um, it or found out otherwise. You know, the problem I have is when you, you start to get dirt, like, and, I mean, you use cabbage, which is a great example, 120 days, 100 days. I've seen them for 70 days. Mm -hmm. And um, I've never experienced a 70 day harvest off of a cabbage ever, ever. Um, but there's something to be said about that, which we'll get into that here in a second. Um, I, I want to, I want to think about, and I don't know the answer to this, but across the board 
if they have seed to harvest days, do you think that it, it seems that it's a standardized number across the board? You know, for, generally speaking, for not, a particular you know, variety of that vegetable. Yes. Right. Yes. So how do how do they come up with that number? I imagine some university when they did their testing of the sea before it ever went to market, they right. tracked a number of things, including how long did it take from the point of when they seeded it to the per- point of when it germinated to the point of when it harvest was yeah. harvested and also considered the weather conditions that they'd recommend growing that particular vegetable in. So I'm almost certain, but, this is just an assumption, but it's a heavy assumption is that it's a standardized process, meaning they're going to start that seed at the perfect temperature and they're going to give it the best environment possible. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the same thing as, I mean, you know, have you ever bought a ele- piece of electronics as a battery and they're like, you're going to get five hours of runtime on it, but you only get like three and you're like, mm-hmm. well, what the heck? And it's like, well, you know, if you like drones are enough, no, are f- they, this is applies to them directly is you'll get 33 minutes of flight time out of it. Well, if you ever watch them when they test it, it's in a room with no wind tethered. They don't have to do anything. The drone doesn't have to think, do anything. <laughs> it just hovers and the battery mm-hmm. runs. Right. And so that's where that number comes from. It's same with cameras and stuff like that. It's the, the room is cooled. It's not being on off, on off, switched around and you know, all these different things. Same with phones. Um, they don't have a bunch of extra apps running on them and stuff like that. So it's perfect conditions. And I imagine that's what's going on here. And that's why I say that they do factor in the germination time because it is a standardized process at some point And they factored in, they put the seed in the ground. They give it that optimum temperature. Remember what I told you about the carrots where it germinated in just a few days mm-hmm. and then it came up. So then we get into the wording and it's like up to. And so just by doing that, now you've built, you've padded yourself in because they know that we're not going to all start our seeds at 53.3 degrees. You know, that's, that's not possible, you know, so we're not mm-hmm. all giving them perfect conditions. And I think it's really hard to give them perfect conditions too. I almost don't think it's possible. Yeah. I have a, uh, a Napa light cabbage here that one website has 60 to 75 days Another seller has 60, approximately is how it's written, 60 days. And so days to germinate for the one that has approximately 60 days is 7 to 10. So you're telling me that, let's say on the long end, it's 10 days to germinate. Within 50 days, I have a full head of cabbage. That's what they say. Mm -hmm. We're going to find out. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) and see, that's the thing. Now, you have to remember, though. It's not just the germination time they're giving it the optimum stuff. It's, you know, all the way across. It's even during growing. So they're probably fertilizing heavy. They're probably giving it the exact amount of sunlight, you know, that's been calculated, this, that, and the other. And so, like my garden, for instance, it doesn't get, especially this time of year, part of the garden won't get enough sunlight to for rapid growth. Mm-hmm. But in the spring, things grow really fast. You know, and I think it's a combination of like temperature, rains. I've, you know, everybody goes out and works their gardens up real good and mends the beds real good in the spring. But in the fall, it's none. I, I don't know the, the numbers, but I would imagine that a lot of people, including myself, are not the best at staying up with amending beds and getting them prepared as we would for spring mm-hmm. because we're looking forward to winter. We're tired. We're done. So I think all of this kind of factors in. You also have to fold in that there's less growing around you. So in the early part of spring, your trees aren't as full. Yeah. Right. You know, in your individual garden, you may have less things growing. There's less things that have some height on them. Think about some of the things we even grow during the summer and how tall some of those plants that would be surrounding whatever this new planting is. You know, that's my whole thing, right? Like the amount of times I've shaded out something and didn't realize it until the the point where I'm noting the failure, right? You know? And it's like, well, of course it didn't work. Yeah. You know? Um. So all of those things I think matter. And and you, I think you mentioned this idea of how um, nutrient dense is the soil at that point. You know. Yeah. Or yeah not. So so for example, like I just 
uh, mended one of my beds. But, man, it's been used since through winter, spring, and summer. It may It's not up to par, <laughs> but it's the best that I can do. So it's going to struggle a little bit. I know that going into it. Um, I like the way you you make it sound like you're the only one that's ever shaded out something in your garden. <laughs> and there's like so many people listening that are just like, ah, oh, mm-hmm. I'm doing that right now. You know, and I mean, hell, I've, I'm doing it as well. Um, my corn is a lot taller than I thought it would be. My popcorn is. So all of these things kind of factor together. Um, and it's just it's interesting when you start putting it in. And then I so I do think that they factor in the germination time into the growing time to the harvest. But there's all kinds of things that can happen in the middle. So I think they also do a direct sow, whereas we're most people for some of these things are putting them in seed starts and Mm -hmm. then moving them over. So you have to think through that hardening off process. You set it back. Then you transplant it. You're given a transplant shock. That'll set it back. Might not be much. But look, we're talking days here. I mean, we're measuring in days at this point. You know, some people are wanting to, and it sounds like Sarah wants to, is it going to be 100 days? Is it going to be 105 days? You know, there's that's a, not a lot of time. So every little thing that we do will set that plant back to an extent. Mm-hmm. You get a little bit of drought, sets it back. You get a pest, it sets it back. You know, um, I don't know. Something have, else will set um, it back. Weeds will set it back. I have um, a couple of squash plants. I have a bunch of things in containers, but a couple of squash plants, one single plant in each container. And every day I'm watering the containers. These plants are huge. These plants are as big as most uh, squash um, zucchini get in pl- planted in ground or in a raised bed. Um, and I look at how it wilts every day if i don't give it water and still wilts a little bit again this is in the middle of the summer if i do and there's a level of that plant like kind of repairing itself yeah every day right you know every day and there is an impact on it now moving its energy to produce another set of flowers you know to continue their fruit like it's it's probably the workhorse of the garden right now (laughs) yeah and it's one of those things that we don't we don't realize um, what sets it back. So when they give us those numbers, I don't think they're having to contend with a lot of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times too, they're you know they're putting in, I don't know, hundred plants, and then they're averaging out those. I mean, that's how you would do it. You know, you would take an average, so you wouldn't put out, you know, each you wouldn't just grow one plant and say, well, it took sixty three days. There we sure. go, it's done. Mm-hmm. So we have to keep that in mind too. And that gives us so if we if we think about it that way, that'll give us a range to some extent. And I'm sure you could get on the Google machine and figure it out and you could, you know, we could get down to the nitty gritty. But um, that's my assumption on how they come up with the days to harvest on the seed packets. Do you think that I'm off or that sounds logical? Right. right? But I've been uh, starting brassicas for five years now. And every time I come up with a reason why they, they die, it seems logical in that moment. And then yeah. I adjust and then they die again. Um, so I say that to say, if someone definitively told me that that was a truth, I'd be like, yep, young Ben was right. I am still moving in my garden with the assumption of I'm erroring, erroring on the side of caution. Caution being, I'm going to count the 70 days as a part of this thing germinated. Right. Right. Because it doesn't harm me so much. There's some moments where you may get crops in sooner than you really want it to. But most times you're fighting against getting them later than you want it to. Right. right? So, yeah. and, And for me, it's, you know, what I typically do is I look at it and let's just call it even say 100 days. And I say, okay, it's going to be 120 days. I'll add 20% onto that number. Mm -hmm. Um, And that typically is right. But I can't, and as much as I would, trust me, as much as I would love to be able to put a seed in the ground and say, in 120 days, it will be done. And then in 15 days after that, I'll plant the next thing. And then it will be done in, you know, 60 days. I would love more than any, do you know how easy that would make my life? But I just, I don't have that. And I kind of, you just got to go by hope and prayer. So I use it 
and the more that I've gardened, I've gotten more and more used to how long plants take to grow and what to expect out of them. Um, you know, like lettuce, for example, I'll grow that and I'll know, especially in the spring, like I know when it will bolt. So I can kind of go from there. I also know like when my tomatoes are going to die. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you start to figure all that stuff out. But once you get, you start doing that, that number means less and less. But I also think it's a little bit of a memorization thing. You know what I mean? Like, I think I've just like, I've memorized that like carrots are supposed to be 90 days, you know? Um, And I've never, ever even come close to that. Um, 100, 130 days, you know, just depends. You know, I I wish I am for carrots. So if we take this through as the example, I sowed carrots later than, you know, I, I wanted to. Welcome. My name is Batavia. This is what I do. So I'm looking May 13th. I s- direct sow the carrots. I don't have notes here on when they germinated. I'm sure I could find them. Um, but I'm at let's see days between dates. I'm right at like 70 some odd days. And this variety is said to be ready to harvest anywhere between like 68 and 75 days. Right. You know, so so the, I wish I would have I was checking the tops of them. I wish I would have pulled the carrot to see. But you know what else I can bet? I can bet that those carrots within the bed are not the same size. Good example yeah. of I have harvested some sweet corn recently, which I, you knocked me over with a feather, man. <laughs> I'm not going to be happier. Um, and I harvested the sweet corn. Day one, one ear was ready. Day two, one ear was uh, ready. Day three, three ears were ready. And I still have corn that's of varying sizes. It was all sown in the same day. You know, generally speaking, it probably all germinated in the same day. Now, yeah. why would one be ready to harvest and the other isn't? Yeah. And you know what? We've we've even totally missed the ball on some of this stuff. And it comes down to, um, oh, man, pollination. Mm-hmm. You know, pollination is a big part of this, too. Mm-hmm. And so um, for these crops that require that. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For crops that require it. So you've got to think about that and all this. So, um, you know, as far as like our experiences with this, I have not found many things to be accurate. I agree with what Batavia said about radishes. Um, I can see that being mostly accurate because that is a very quick growing crop. Now. Are you getting the biggest size radish you can get in 30 days? Or if you went 40 days, could you get a bigger radish? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, let's face it. I'm not trying to harvest a radish the size of my thumbnail and be like, I got to harvest everybody. You know, I'm trying to get something a little bit bigger. Yeah, but I also think that radishes, I'm glad you brought that back around. Check the variety. What size is the recommendation for harvesting? Right. Mm-hmm. Because there's a point of if it's supposed to be the size of a silver dollar and I'm waiting for it to get bigger, it may not be as tasty. Um, right. So that's radishes. I do want to go back as when you brought back radishes, I thought to myself, it really doesn't have a whole lot of work to do. The leaves pop up then it creates this little bulb in most mm-hmm. cases for the varieties we've been talking about, you know, over the course of these months. There's some varieties like daikon radish that gets a lot larger right um but it has so little work to do if you think about like um the early globe radish uh, that's the one that's in our shop and not a lot of work to do but think about something like corn think about the motions it has to go through something like cabbage think about what tomato plants have to go through when it comes to from that point of seeding to the point of harvesting um you know the more work that plant has to do I think the more opportunities there are for time to adjust up or down yeah at the various stages of its growth no I agree with that and I mean you know I've always said you know for instance like I've got uh, mango peppers growing this year so many peppers I stopped picking them mm-hmm. I don't even because I don't know what to do with them so I just stop I don't even care just do what you got to do you know live your best life because I can't live my life with 500,000 peppers coming off a of vine but a bell pepper gives you like six to 12 peppers mm-hmm. what but they're so much bigger the plant has to work so much harder to make them and so we start thinking like ground cherries mm-hmm. you know which i call husk tomatoes um so many husk tomatoes come off of them it's unbelievable 
But then you grow some varieties of tomatoes and you get just a handful at a time. And when I say a handful for a tomato, I mean, you know, you're getting two, three tomatoes. But these ground cherries, I get hundreds of them mm-hmm. nonstop. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> I think you're exactly right. And when it, I think where the difficulty for this, as we speak, I'm thinking about this, the difficulty for the seed packets is when you have like a carrot or a cabbage where you're only harvesting one thing off of it. Cause you got to hit the nail on the head in order for everybody to be happy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But you do a tomato plant where you're going to get over and over harvest. That's, that's a lot easier to, to get and to stomach too, because what is a tomato plant? Do you have a tomatoes a packet in your hand that says it on there? No, but like mostly like 90 days, 90 days mm-hmm. for the first tomato. <laughs> and then you're getting tomatoes for another 30 days <laughs> at minimum. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's like, okay, yeah, I'll wait 90 days for that. But then you put a cabbage in the ground. You're like, okay, 120 days. I got my one cabbage. Yay. But you know what a good example is when you came back to tomatoes or any of these that you're starting from seed, you know, indoors or outdoors in some type of uh, container, and then you're going to transplant in. So the number of days that it gets to the point where you're ready to transplant, the amount of time that it lingers wherever it's sitting, right? Like one could argue you get a few true leaves, something could be transplanted into the garden space and be just fine, right? Under the right conditions, it'll continue to grow. I think about my tomato plants, which went in, geez, I think memorial day weekend so it's like the 27th or something my tomato plants went in but i started those like in march or something so they sat on my back porch there easily there was a month that they were on the i I feel i'm I'm a little bit embarrassed as i say that out loud (laughs) but it was like a month that they sat on my back porch and again let's pretend that the growing conditions were ideal for that are you telling me that the total number of uh, days is the same, even though it's sat in that pot about the same size on my back porch. No. Well, why did it stay that size? Because it didn't have the conditions, the nutrients that it, it needed bound. to get to that next stage. Right. Shame on you, Batavia. Well, and so, I mean, but see, that's an important thing to think about, too, is as you go and you, you're growing a plant and you're potting it up and you're moving it, you know, the idea is not to let it get root bound because mm-hmm. that's going to slow it down. Mm-hmm. You know, the plant will automatically stop and it, it well, I take that back. It will start to flower and fruit because it's like, hey, we're going to die. Let me get these genetics out there. And I keep saying that over and over because it's true. It's all about preserving the genetics of each individual plant. So, um, you know, I put. OK, I'm thinking now. I had some peppers this year that I did not put, um, I left in the pot and they flowered a month and fruited a month before the ones I planted outside. (laughs) So there you go. You know what I mean? So maybe there's something to that, but in general, root bound is an issue. And a lot of times it's really hard when you're starting seeds to catch it, to plant it at the right time. And with experience, you start to get more and more of it. You know, um, I like to pull my plants out and I'll start like my tomatoes. I'll up pot them before the roots wrap around the seed cell. So what I like to do is I like to pull it up and not see roots, long roots all wrapped around. I like to see them just kind of poking through the soil and then I'll replant, repot. And that's usually how I do it. And that will help step it up to the next level. Yeah, I think... um and, and sorry about the back and forth on this, but late breaking news. Sowed on 513th, this is a carrot variety, uh, emerged on 520 is my note. So that's seven days. And now I'm 79 days later. Now, to complete this episode, I'm going to do this alone. That would be me going out, pulling a carrot, because we're at past the point of the days to maturity based on this particular variety now the question is is it nine inches long and one and a half inches wide because that's about what i should be getting out of this particular variety 
right? So all of those things come in. Something like a cabbage, generally speaking, that's a little bit different. Like it's supposed to get to a particular size, right? Um, when you talk about something like a broccoli head, like they're telling you about the size, a carrot. You know that I could have pulled a carrot two weeks ago. What size it would be? Don't know, but it would have been a carrot, you know? Yeah. So excuse me, all of those things matter. Um, I don't want to use green beans as an example, especially because we're coming out of that growing season. Um, I'm just thinking about other vegetables, any of your leafy greens, like that you can harvest as an individual leaf, days to harvest, you get to decide when this thing is harvestable, if you will. Right, right. And I think that's an important um, part of it too. And the other thing is, it's just like you said with the radishes, are we harvesting at the right time? Mm-hmm. You know, are we harvesting at the optimal time? Um, the collards, are the other are leaves at the right time? Are we trying to get bigger leaves and the mm-hmm. plant will actually produce? So that's all part of it as well. Um, so the question becomes, can you speed this process up? That's the question. What do you think? I know the process from see to harvest yeah i think uh, I'm, I'm gathering my thoughts as i you know as the uh the monitor replays the question because they're saying is she not answered it yet is she okay up there <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the teleprompter comes up again with the question um i'm i'm going to go with something that i know you're not going to be crazy about as an answer i it think depends. yes you can if you plant in the absolute optimal conditions for where you're gardening at. The most non-answer answer that there is. But that feeds directly back into what you believe to be the truth around the days include from seeding to harvest, right? So sure, you're not going to have like the test garden, like the test kitchen. You're not gonna have the test garden in your growing space. But I'm talking about, all right, it's recommended eight weeks before your average last frost date, you know, plant this out. You're planting it out. You have a um, a well-amended bed. You don't have any obstructions, like all of those things. I think that you can speed it up. I think that you can fertilize these plants and speed things up. Um, So, yeah, that's my answer. Two part. Yeah, I agree with that completely. I think... um timing i think overall care Mm -hmm. you know um i was just like i was just out there looking at my corn but i got weeds growing in in between the corn and stuff that's going to slow it down yeah it's going to steal the nutrients it's going to steal the water and i know that Mm -hmm. the question is did i go and weed the bed no i didn't you know i need to but that's part of it so it's like continuous care and I, i i you know I've always heard this um, about some people, you know, we'll see, I'll go to somebody's house and they're, and not even a vegetable garden, let's just say a flower bed is just immaculate. You know, there's a lady up the road for me. Every single day, she is weeding, watering, and taking care of her garden. Every single day, all day, she's doing that. Y'all didn't know that I moved down the street from Young Ben. Yeah. That's me. I'm her. But for my flower garden, not necessarily for my vegetable garden. But she'll do it for all of it. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's amazing. But it's so much constant labor yeah. that she's doing. And I look at it and I'm just like, it's beautiful. I love what she's doing. I love her passion. I can't, I, I don't have it in me to do that to that extent. You know what I mean? Like, I can't be out there eight, nine hours a day Mm -hmm. weeding consistently. And that's where herbicides and stuff came in because you, you know, all that stuff, which a lot of us don't use. I've never put an herbicide in my garden for sure. Um, But, you know, my neighbor, for instance, he's a, I don't know how old he is. He's got to be almost, if he's not in his eighties, he's real close to it. He goes out there and he is on his hands and knees pulling clovers or oh. some kind of weed out of his grass. Oh. Like he'll be laying in his yard, picking that stuff out. His, it looks amazing. Yeah. But that's the effort that he's putting into it. So the question becomes like, are we putting the ma- the right amount of effort into this process? You know? Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> I think 
the the answer to that is you put the effort you want to put into it, but just know that you're going to, it's going to slow it down. Yeah. And I completely think that fertilizing will speed it. I know it will speed it because I did it this year. Yeah. I think uh, you get what you put in and sometimes you don't get what you put in, right? But yeah. you're not going to get much more than what you put in. Um, I need to send my neighbor a text. Um, this is the neighbor that's on the other side of the cage, baby. Because, you know, you know, the, we've had this conversation a couple of times each year. The weeds that grow up between her fence and my the cage baby. So her fence is just about as tall as the cage baby. They're starting to flower. Mm -hmm. So the text I need to send her is, hey, can I come over to your yard and pull some weeds? Oh, they're, you know, they look like dandelions, but they're not quite. And they grow like five feet tall. But flowering is the first stage, and that's fine. But guess what ends up happening? The weeds I'm pulling right now are from last year when those weeds flowered that dropped yeah. in my bed, right? Um, so there is this element of, you know, are you working for a future you, you know, and yeah. your future garden space? So there is that piece of it. Um, I do want the listeners to know that through this episode, I have narrowed down the variety of cabbage that I'm growing primarily tied to the thing I want to grow, but also the days from seed to harvest. And I'm going with one to two cabbage that are going to be harvestable in 60 to 75 days. I know like the cable company versus varieties that were more like 87 days and then up to a hundred days. Right. Um, so back to Sarah's question, what is the variety? Amico. It's a okay. hybrid. It's a... Um, How dare you grow a hybrid? Is, he, is that... Ugh. You're not growing that, are you? No, I'm growing... I'm actually... <laughs> because of the debacle with the shade um, house, I'm, I'm growing our flat Dutch cabbage season uh, we have in our okay. seed shop, which is available to you if you check the link below. Um... Actually, I didn't. Can you believe? Because I don't have it in my little, I have it in my section of the seeds that we ship out. I didn't check the days to harvest for that. Stand by. There may be a correction. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what the days to harvest is on. And I have to check on that, too. I don't really but, care. I'm going to plant them either way. Remember, this is because I'm in Chicago, Illinois, and my average first frost is November the 1st. But most importantly, it gets cold and stays cold after that. Right. You know, so that's the factor. That's the element that I'm factoring in when it comes to by the time you hear this, which would be pretty close to when we recorded it. I have like weeks and weeks and weeks until that I have way more than, you know, 60 days, way more than 75 days left. But one, I haven't seeded these two. I really needed to be like harvestable by that time. Yeah. You know? um, Leonard so, just sent it over to me too, just so you know. Say it again. Leonard just sent the days of harvest oh, over good, good, to good. me. It's a hundred days. Why would he send the to me? Because I because I'm better than you. I don't know. Well, it's, <laughs> I mean, this is Leonard's opinion, so we know how accurate he sent me that a is. link, and it says a uh, hundred days, but it's known to be uh, able to be storage for months in a root oh, cellar. Dang so it. that's. That's the that's draw huge, to it. Though. That, it that's huge, though. It is huge. That's a part of, and it's unrelated to Sarah's question, kinda. But what are you going to do with this once you get it, right? You know, yeah. which is a whole different episode. But you know, I love to talk about that kind of stuff too. Well, apparently, my Maybe family can eat the hell out of cabbage, so I ain't worried about the storage date overly. But you know, if I'd grow a bumper crop, it would, it would be nice. So, um, yeah. Um, I have just to, to clarify and save some face. I have. Um, about three heads of cabbage and for me it's just me so i don't need like you know a dozen heads of cabbage and i want to grow some other things i have three heads of cabbage that are going to take me into the fall they've been mm -hmm. slowly growing and they're your traditional size cabbage and so that's the reason why i worked out well that a napa style cabbage and i want to try to make my own kimchi i'm nervous about it but i want to try it and so that all lines up when it comes to um the cabbage that I'm going to give a whirl this season. Yeah. I've never successfully grown a Napa cabbage. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to be hopeful. Me either, though. I'm sorry. That's the proper answer. Well, <laughs> so uh, before we move on to the question of the day. Yeah, we're going to do two today. The episode and then another question. I do need to tell you about our video sponsor or not our video, 
our uh, podcast sponsor. My bad. Bleed Hint over. Hint? Oh, wow. yeah. is that? <laughs> no, uh, the planter app. Um, somebody asked us why we um, advertise the planter app for as long as we have. And it's because we genuinely believe in it and the ability it has to make help you in your garden. Um, we don't want to advertise anything we don't believe in. And this is a product that we use over and over in our spaces for planning, learning, um, combative and companion planning, which is always like a big source of contention in a garden. So um, it's very visual and it just makes it easier to see instead of like reading and memorizing. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, Batavia, but when you see it over and over, do you tend to memorize it better than if you had to like read it over and over? I do. And and I'll let you finish with this, but I want to comment related to that and Sarah's question. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's on the Apple and Google Play stores. Uh, we have a link below that will get you a discount on the lifetime membership. Um, it's a very good discount, too. So check that out. Use it f- to plan your gardens. Refer back. I know, um, for instance, I'm having issues with where things were planted this year. So I'm really going to be paying attention to my previous year's plan. Mm-hmm. So when I make my next plan, I'm not doubling up and I can really make things change. Um, and for instance, like I just removed a trellis out of my garden. So I've got to go back into my master file and remove that trellis off of it yeah. completely. So I won't accidentally plant it again. So check out the planter app. That's the P-L-A-N-T-E-R app. And uh, get it in the Google and Apple Play Store. And use the link below. And you can use it on your phone, tablet, or even on your your PC, which is a big, big plus. You want to get down and dirty, put it on your PC screen and go to town. One of the biggest struggles I face in my garden, it outside of like just the labor of it all mm-hmm. is uh, planning and sticking to the plan. Mm-hmm. And then uh, to be quite frank, I, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say it, but it's spacing of crops. Right. I know I wouldn't be embarrassed. I think that's natural. I am now battling five tomato plants. Remember, my neighbor's landscaper told me I should have three there. And I'm like, gosh, I knew he was right when he said it, you know, <laughs> and I'm sitting here now like, ah, it would be so but much But your easier. initial thought was, I'm the host of the Backyard Gardens podcast. You don't tell Damn straight. me. Damn straight. <laughs> I'll go through the trouble of managing five. And now I'm like, oh, it's so much trouble to manage five. Uh, really quickly, before we get to the question of the day, really, really quickly, um, I pride myself in not remembering all of this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so some things I will naturally over time, the more I work with it, remember other things I won't. And that's just fine. Yeah. But as time goes on, you remember more and more faster because it let's, becomes a lot of it becomes repetitive. Let's hope so. Yeah. I've seen you memorize stuff faster. <laughs> some stuff. OK, so this one, um, again, is from our um our super secret, not so secret email account, BYG question at gmail.com. And uh, I hope I'm saying your name right. But Yana. Hey, Yana. There we go. Up, oh, never mind. Catherine. I'm confused. Well, uh, well, no. uh, emails one name is stated in the bottom. Excuse me. No. So it's, there's no person that's Yana. The email was Yana, but it says my name is Catherine. So oh, Catherine. Okay. Well, hey, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was okay with giving two hey's, you know. Yeah, hey, 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 hey. So he goes, my name is Catherine, and I'm in, growing in Tampa, Florida. My question is regarding fertilizing for sweet potatoes. I'm growing slip spot from a big box store in a very large container, and the vines have been doing so great, but I'm starting to notice some yellowing of older leaves. I'm guessing it needs fertilizer, but because sweet potatoes are a root crop, I'm worried about just feeding the vines and directing energy away from the roots. I've only had small sweet potato harvests in the past, and I'm hoping to maximize my harvest this year. Do you have any suggestions on timing and type and balance of fertilizer for this container bed? I've been a longtime listener of the show. Thank you very much, Catherine, and love what you guys are doing. Thank you for creating this community. You are more than welcome. We're happy to be here. Hey, Catherine. Uh, thanks for the reminder. I actually need to get out and fertilize my uh, sweet potato patch. Do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I literally so how do was you counting fertilize the number yours? of days that since I planted them. How do you fertilize yours? Like, what's your schedule? So I don't necessarily have a schedule defined because remember, I'm still getting on the boat of, dang it, I need to do it. Uh, so I planted them mid 
Oh, geez. I'm about six weeks in. Yeah, I'm about, no, no, no. Yeah, about six weeks into their growth. They look great. Um, I'd want to fertilize them somewhere between six and eight weeks because I went in with the pre-planting fertilizer. Let's just say that. Um, they started off with compost, but also a granular fertilizer. So that has been feeding them for the last six weeks. I'm going to come in because I have it available and the vines are still easy for me to get around and I'm going to like kind of um, dig in the soil, some additional granular fertilizer and water well. If I had a water soluble fertilizer, this would be really good, you know, because you can, you don't have to worry about getting that close to the root. Um, And we're past the point of something like, you know, fish and seaweed, you know, fertilizer being a thing, because that's something that you can get all over the leaves and not worry about it. Um, So I Honestly, I don't know that I've even fertilized after my initial planting in previous years, but I want to make an effort to do that this year. And I probably won't fertilize again. I probably should fertilize maybe just at the beginning of September again. When are you planning to harvest them? At the end of October. Okay. Yeah. So I do a pre-planting fertilizer as you do. Um, I plant... And then I, I dig my trench. I put in um, well-balanced fertilizer. I may, in the initial planting, put in a little extra nitrogen. Because generally, you know, especially if you... I, I Let me take that back. If I order sweet potato slips, which I haven't done in a couple years, then that's what I'll do. I'll put in some nitrogen because they're usually kind of beat up. I grew my own sweet potato slips and they, you know, there was no shipping time or anything like that. Or uh, roots really removed. So I, I didn't add anything, but I do put the well balanced in and then I come back and as soon as I see that the, um, the vines are starting to take over and you know, you know how it'll start to be hard to see the bed. Mm-hmm. I'll put in another fertilizing and then like this year, I think I may have given it the, uh, fish fertilizer once and I just keep an eye on the plant. And if I don't need, if I don't see anything, I don't, I don't give it anymore. It's one of those crops that doesn't need a whole, whole lot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, um, and I've had pretty good luck with doing that saves on the fertilizer bill as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing I do is I don't water them that much either. Um, watering them a lot will make them, um, I'm trying split, to think of the word. Split. No, not split. It, um, it'll make them dry mm-hmm. when you cook them instead of that creamy texture that we all want. So this year, what I've done, for instance, is the water's off in the bed. I haven't watered them in like three weeks. And um, they're exploding in growth. Like I was just out there and I was like, wow, this sweet potato is really starting to take off finally. So it's kind of working. Um, if you think about it, I probably fertilized them. What month is this? This is August. I probably fertilized them about six weeks ago. So the fertilizer is probably about done Mm -hmm. and I'm probably going to be harvesting them in about a month. So I'm not really worried about putting anything else in the, in the ground. So, um, I would just, and if you're getting some yellow leaves, shoot it a little bit of fish fertilizer. Don't go heavy on the nitrogen. I I wouldn't do that, but that fish fertilizer is pretty light and um, it could give it just enough to boost it, but you don't want to grow more vines than you do Mm -hmm. roots. So Mm -hmm. that's part of it. Did Catherine say she was growing in a container? She says a container bed and a very large container. Okay. Because, you know, we always face the challenge of if it's, it could even be like a hundred gallon container, something like that, you know, you're you're probably generally fine, but it's not the same as growing in an in-ground bed. And so you may need to increase the fertilizer. So if I were just growing sweet potatoes and didn't have the worries of anything else, can really get on top of things i would go initial pre-planting fertilizer fertilizing again at six weeks and then again at 12 ish weeks and then i would stop and wait until i'm ready to harvest um but again and these i mean there's, there's no hard and fast rule for me for that that just seems logical you know a couple of weeks for that fertilizer grain well balanced granular fertilizer to work itself in you know, it feeds for another handful of weeks and then now yep. I'm starting it over again. That's the logic I use. Yeah. And I mean, I just, I've been over the years, uh, past five years I've been growing sweet potatoes. No, seven years I've really been growing sweet potatoes. I've kind of tweaked it a little bit mm-hmm. and I've, I'm, 
This year, depending on the harvest and then the texture of the potato, will really tell me if I was right. Yeah. Um, the amount of vines that I have, I know I'm going to have some potatoes. You know, there's it's, there's no question. It's wild. And for containers, I do more like probably four to five weeks in the, in the best version of myself as a gardener. Yeah. Um, I came across a video. I'm just going to say that I came across a video. And I remember my very first containers that I was growing sweet potatoes and never grown them before. And I remember thinking all along, like these leaves look pretty wimpy. I remember you know, seeing all kinds of things about how sweet potato vines take over and the amount of leaves it produced was indicative of the number of sweet potatoes and the size of sweet potatoes that I got. You know, I've not had that poor of a harvest since then. And I've grown in containers since then as well for sweet potatoes. Um, but I think the, probably the combination of, and the next year's compost was more, it was heavier, right? So better kind of soil makeup. And then in more recent years, I've started to amend my soil, at least at the beginning. That's you're going right. to, at this point, I feel confident and say you're guaranteed to get some fertilizer at the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's, that's goes back to the episode where we were saying like, you're going to amend, generally speaking, we amend much better in the spring than we do in the <laughs> late summer. Mm -hmm. preparing for the fall season. So it's just natural. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, that's really how you do it. Just don't go heavy on the nitrogen, but you still want to give it some nitrogen um, and then just, just let it go. And um, don't water too much. Don't water too much. I mean, we had five weeks of no rain and it was 97 degrees roughly for a week. And I watered it once in those five weeks. So um, maybe twice. And that was it. And everything else was getting, you know, two to three times a week watering. Um, but then when the rain comes, you know, clearly it soaks it up. But I mm -hmm. think it it must have done right because I go back out there and the water's still off and um, they're just taken over. So mm -hmm. the, and I had a deer eat all the leaves off of them at one point, too, which is another thing is don't cut the leaves. Don't trim the vines and you'll get more potatoes. That's how that works. You know, sweet potato leaves are edible, right? <sighs> <laughs> so everybody thank you for listening to the backyard gardens podcast and joining us um if you'd like to support us definitely um get yourself some seeds become a subscriber um come see us on youtube i'm at sandy bottom homestead and batavia's at be better gardens and other than that have a beautiful day and remember we're always going to learn to grow and grow for change see ya Now you know why people feel like celebrating at harvest time. All over the world, people have feasting and good times when the crops have been gathered in. Well, we hope you enjoyed the show, and thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so by checking out our seed shop below. We have all kinds of seeds available for you, and we're going to be adding new seeds shortly. So check that out. Get yourself some seeds. It's free shipping, over $35 orders. So go ahead, get a full garden. What are you waiting for? Order your seeds and stock up. Or you can become a subscriber. You can either be an Apple subscriber or a patron, and that will help support the show. You'll get one free episode every month, an extra episode, that is. So we definitely would like love to see you over there and become part of our crew. Join the Backyard Gardens Community Garden in Facebook. That's free. Go ahead, join that, and join the community where all the listeners get together and they just they can help each other out with their trials and tribulations and just show off their gardens. There's not a better way to do it. And if you're curious about what's going on in our gardens, you can check out our individual YouTube channels. So I'm at Sandy Bottom Homestead, and Batavia is at Be Better Garden. You can check that out and see how each of us are growing and what we talk about on those because a lot of times we will coincide with the podcast and help add information in that maybe we didn't get out in the show or we feel that's pertinent at a certain time of year so check that out and enjoy seeing our gardens and what we do in them and we have an Amazon store which has all the products that we use and recommend in our gardens and it helps support our show. And we also add to this list periodically. So be sure to check it out periodically to see if there's anything that you need for your garden. Everything that you do, including a like and a subscribe and even a review will help us learn to grow and grow for change. See ya.